alaikum and afternoon everyone i welcome you all to the sixth symposium of managing the complications of cirrhosis in 2020 i'm dr farhana kayani uh, from quetta so uh, in this session actually we will be focusing over the emerging concepts of uh, regarding diag diagnostics and therapeutics in the field of managing the complications of cirrhosis so in this regard in this session, our chairs will be Dr. Tasawwar Hussain, Dr. Muhammad Saleh, Dr. Bashir Sheikh, Dr. Bakht Buland, and Dr. Junaid Saleem. So our first talk is regarding current advances in the, in the prevention and management of hepatorenal syndrome by Professor Ghayasun Nabi Tayyab. And uh, Dr. Pro Professor Ghayasun Nabi Tayyab, he is Professor Consultant Gastroenterologist at Lahore General Hospital. Study Flavored Seeds for inviting me here to talk on current advances in the prevention and management of hyperplasic syndrome on the PSSLD 2020 platform. Uh, I understand that these are difficult times and it's very difficult to hold the virtual meetings. Uh, it is best to have uh, on one on one meeting, but uh, under the circumstances, this is the best that the organizers could do. I don't have any financial disclosure pertaining to this presentation. And let me uh, start off with a case which I dealt in uh, dealt about a couple of years ago, a 50 years old lady which was hospitalized for arrestus and confusion. She was uh, suffering from hepatitis C related cirrhosis for the past seven years and had a complicated uh, uh, complicated with the cites for the past seven years, you know, for the past six months. And she has been taking lactulose with four to five stools uh, per day. And she has been taking uh, diuretics in the form of furosemide and spironolactone with a uh, variable response initially good, but later on, the creatine started to rise uh, because of which the physician had to reduce the dose. And three days back, she underwent a five liter high volume paracentesis for abdominal distension without any albumin infusion. And at the same time, the ultrasound specialist who took out the fluid, he uh, gave her uh, a tablet of nimesulite as well. On physical examination, her temperature was 36.4 degrees per night, blood pressure was 102 uh, by 74. Pulse was 78, rate of respiration was 16 per minute, and uh, BMI was 24. She was uh, in autostravic encephalopathy with disorientation in time and date. The mucous membranes were dry, and she had a mild tenderness all over the abdomen and had a palpable left of the liver with 7 centimeter large pain. Shifting dullness is also positive. So, all in all, we can say that she's suffering from an advanced decompensated liver disease, but is this the diagnosis or the other things that we can consider? And at the same time, if this lady is suffering from ascites, is this a simple disease-related ascites or is she suffering from a complicated ascites? And what tests are required? This is something that we need to decide. So possible answers are that definitely she's suffering from disease-related and stage liver disease. She's suffering from a polyphysic encephalopathy. She's got ascites. She has been receiving diuretics with good response, but now she's uh, in intractable, all not resistant, uh, and creatinine starts going up. Uh, since she is tender in the abdomen, but neutrophilia is there. She has had undergone a recent intervention as well. So spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is a possibility. Can she have a decompensation of HCC? Can we do uh, a CT scan at this stage? The answer is maybe yes, maybe no. And what type of HRS? Uh, is she suffering from according to the new classification? Is it HRS AKI or non AKI type of the disease? So let's look at the lab data for this patient. Uh, hemoglobin is 9, MCV is 105, platelet count is 45,000, and neutrophil count is 75, but a uh, bit up. INI is 1.3, albumin 2.6, the total blood is 2.1, BUN is 38, creatinine is 2.5, BUN analysis shows normal without any protein, urea, alpha beta protein 50. Israel flow uh, shows low side protein with WBC 2500 in polys of 85%. And on ultrasonography, serotic liver with 15 centimeters size being Debenous societies, equidinic kidneys, and versus hyalum. So, classical case of a complicated liver disease. Her B, uh, baseline creatine, which was looked at in a previous record, showed up more 7 milligram, which was done about three weeks uh, 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 early on this patient. The blood culture results are pending, and her diuretic and lactulose were discontinued in view of the photosystemic 
So where do we get? What is the final diagnosis? Final diagnosis says that definitely she's suffering from serial head cirrhosis. She's got portosystemic encephalopathy. She's got ascites. She's got diabetic intractable ascites. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And we need to have a further workup on HCC and possibly she's suffering from HRS, AKI. What is the expected mortality in a patient like this? If you look at this cartoon, we can see that had she not been suffering from HRS, the mortality would have been uh, exactly the same, just like a routine uh, decomposite liver disease patient. Um, in type 2 HRS, as compared to type 1 HRS, the mortality is better, but in type 1 HRS, uh, there's a sharp decline in the serve. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Rayas and Nabi Dev for this. Uh, which have this. happened, they constitute to be the risk factors, and in terms of prevention, they need to be taken into consideration. And uh, out of all the complications of liver cirrhosis, it carries the worst prognosis. In uh, HRS, di uh, AKI type, the mean survival is less than two weeks unless we intervene more aggressively in these patients. And over the years, we have understood that the definition of uh, HRS has changed significantly. If I look at the AKI, the definition has evolved significantly in the past two years, starting from rifle in 2002, acute kidney injury network in 2005, and kidney disease improvement global outcome 2012. Similarly, in the same line, we have an improved understanding about the hepatitis syndrome and the last uh, uh, change in the uh, definition of uh, HRS came through the International Club of Societies uh, way back in 2015. And we have started to understand that in stage one, we have got stage one, A, one, B, depending upon the creatinine level and then stage two and stage three. So these are three st stages of the HRS, according to the which, depending upon the creatinine, we know the severity of the HRS, and then we have a uh, distinction between the uh, type as well. Previously, the thing that we used to call HRS type 1, now we know that it needs to be called as HRS acute kidney injury, and then the type 2 is renamed as uh, non-acute kidney injury. So increase in the serum creatinine of 0.3 milligram per deciliter, 48 hours, or increase in the serum creatinine of more than 1.5 times from baseline, as compared to the one in for three months back, when available, should be used as pain line. And no response to diuretic withdrawal and two-day fluid challenge with one gram per kilogram per day of albumin, 20-25%, cirrhosis with ascites, absence of shock, and no current or recent use of nephrotoxic drugs like NSAIDs or contrast dyes uh, in the absence of structural kidney. This is the one which constitutes the HRS, acute kidney injury type, as, uh, as is uh, in this patient. So what is the pathophysiology in the development of HRS? We have got two theories. One is the systemic vessel dilatation theory, leading to the reduced perfusion of the kidneys, and the other one is the direct reflex uh, because of the severe liver injury, leading to the renal vasoconstriction and development of the, uh, of the uh, acute kidney injury. And this cartoon explains quite comprehensively the changes which occur in the hypertrophic syndrome starting from the increase in the renal endotensin uh, aldosterone system, increased sympathetic nervous system, leading to the reduced uh, blood flow going to the kidney. At the same time, reduction in the effective circulatory volume with the uh, cardiomyopathy of the cirrhosis, splenic vasodilatation, uh, generation of nitric oxide and prostaglandin endocannabinoids, peripheral vasodilatation, all these factors, they lead to uh, in compensated cirrhosis with this cascade and in decompensated cirrhosis with this uh, cascade, development of renal failure in these settings. So just to um, summarize, in terms of possible preventive methods, like uh, arterial visualization, these are things that need to be considered and hyperdynamic circulation, these are things which need to be considered and based on these, uh, we need to look at the etiology um, in a given patient, for example, in this patient, we know that we had an advanced decomposite liver disease. We have been giving diuretics, and recently, uh, the diuretics have been leading to the uh, to the worsening of the uh, renal function, meaning by the effective circulatory volume has got reduced. This patient developed uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis following an intervention, and there has been a recent history of large volume paracentesis, and she took a drug off. The dose of mesolide as well. So combination of these factors led to the development of uh, uh, HRS in this patient. These are the factors which need to be, be prevented. Additional factors, maybe things like gastrointestinal bleeding, 
uh, drugs and toxins in addition to non answers these are things which need to be considered and intravascular volume depletion uh, by overuse of uh, overdose of diuretics or uh, lactose induced extra loose motion they can also lead to the development so what kind of initial steps need to be done in patients uh, who are to be considered for a diagnosis of hrs at least 1.5 to 2 liters of isotonic CLN needs to be given to see whether the hemodynamics improve and the urine output improves or not. And one has to be very careful in the people above the age of 50 or the people who have a possibility of having uh, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy in these patients, instead of 1.5 to 2, 2 liters, it is uh, best to give a bolus of uh, 350 to 500 and then in the incremental doses, we may give additional doses. What, what pharmaceutical interventions can we give? It's a long list of drugs which have been tried in the literature, which have been tried in the past, and they all have one thing in common that they lead to the uh, vasoconstriction in the systemic circulation and dilatation of the uh, renal cells uh, vasculature, meaning by an increase in the blood flow towards the kidney, that's the key in terms of uh, uh, intervention. Now we can do it in the form of uh, uh, drugs like thalipressin, we can do in the form of a combination of optotide and mildrin, or maybe systemic physical constraints like norepinephrine alone or in combination of 25% albumin. But mind you, when we give norepinephrine, the patient has to be admitted in the ICU and not in the, uh, in the ward, which is quite difficult in uh, our patient. And the new drug like serlexin, these are the things that we can do. What other possible therapies can be given in the patients and what are the merits and demerits of each therapy? It's a comprehensive uh, uh, cartoon which gives us the various options. Uh, pharmacological, I've just mentioned, renal replacement therapy, artificial liver support, uh, tips, especially in the HRS uh, non-AKI, but it is helpful in the HRS AKI type as well. And the panaca of the of the any uh, uh, decomposite liver disease, liver transplantation, this also can be considered in a patient like this. So what are the general measures? Step by step, First of all, we need to uh, take care of all those things which can worsen the kidney damage. So meaning by that, we need to stop diuretics, we need to uh, stop all uh, kind of nephrotoxic agents and avoid doing anything which can worsen the liver injury. If possible, if the patient can be admitted in the ICU, civic environment. But let me tell you that in DCLD with uh, uh, concomitant coagulopathy, putting in the CVP is again a risk. Fluid chelling needs to be given along with albumin or without albumin, and one has to be very aggressive in terms of looking for the possible sepsis. When we talk about the specific therapies, I've already said that the bridging therapy in the form of pharmacological treatment, visoconstrictors alone or visoconstrictors along with albumin, and then the liver transplantation, TIFs, renal replacement therapy, and mass. These are the very things that we need to consider. And let me tell you that uh, the various pharmacological treatments which have been considered up till now, they all are with the merits and demerits. The commonest one that we use in our setup is telepressin albumin. We give 0.5 to 1 milligram um, of uh, uh, IV slow push every four to six hours of telepressin alone or in combination with uh, albumin. When we give it in combination with albumin, the results are better. And uh, when, we, uh, when we are giving, it is important that in the people above the age of 50, they need to be uh, carefully monitored for our, the presentation of ischemic heart disease. And let me remind you that in quite a good number of these cases, people are suffering from cardiomyopathy as well because of the uh, liver cirrhosis. Octetide alone um, is of no help. Octetide, uh, along with amidrine, does uh, give a good, uh, a good result, but since we don't have the experience with this uh, octotide and mitrine combination because of non-availability. So I shall not uh, spend too much time on this, but early present in NHRS, in all the meta-analysis which have been done, we know that the pooled analysis, pooled uh, rate of, the, of the uh, pooled analysis of these patients show that there's a significant benefit of these patients. The pooled frequency responder patients who, who shows a response with the early present therapy is 24.6%, but then after stopping early present, there's a good number of people who tend to recover as well. In uh, meta-analysis published uh, to, uh, 2014, 
uh, uh, Cochrane analysis, six randomized trials were eligible for inclusion, three trials assessed telepressin one with BD for 12, 15 days. Co-interventions include albumin, pressure, plasma, and cimetidine, and telepressin reduced mortality by 34%, uh, and the control group mortality rate was much higher, so almost double. So meaning by that, telepressin is definitely of help, and that's what we have been observing in our own uh, setup as well. But telepressin is associated with lots of adverse effects as well. On the cardiac side, in the people above the age of 50, angina, uh, my, my, myocardial infarction, on the gastrointestinal side, cramps, vomiting, insulin ischemia, uh, peripheral ischemia, scrotal necrosis, all these things have been happening with telepressin. So it has to be very, very carefully monitored, carefully administered. This new drug, Cerelexin, is a, it's a combined recombinant form of uh, uh, human peptide hormone relaxant 2. It increases renal perfusion in healthy human volunteers. Its properties have been explored in a pilot study in com compensated cirrhotic patients and has shown a good promise as it increased the renal blood flow by 65.4% from baseline with no effect on systemic blood pressure and minimal side effects. So this is something which needs to be looked into and maybe it's the um, uh, drug of the future. Tips in non-acute uh, kidney injury is definitely of help, but in a person like this, it is an alternative therapy. But in those patients only who fail to respond to telepressin plus LB1. So in HRS with acute kidney injury, TIPS may be concerned, but TIPS is basically a treatment for those people who are not suffering from acute kidney injury, rather they are in the category of non-acute kidney injury. When these patients uh, develop significant uh, metabolic acidosis or have significant hyperkalemia, uh, renal replacement therapy can be considered. And similarly, uh, a molecular adsorbent recirculating system mass, we don't have much experience with this. It's a very, very expensive option. Uh, again, can be considered in people who are suffering from HRS, acute kidney injury related. So in the end, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude that the renal syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. HRS has a high rate of mortality. We must give a fluid challenge prior to making the diagnosis. Initial treatment involves albumin along with telepressin, although in certain studies, octetide and midbrain has also been tried. So Alexin is yet to hit the market, so we, don't, we are not really sure about the results, but it does have a potential in terms of improving. Long-term treatment involves consideration of liver disease, plus treating factors, comovers, and patient reference. And in this patient, she underwent liver transplantation and uh, uh, following the liver transplantation, she underwent a couple of sessions for an astronautic stricture. She underwent a treatment for hepatitis C, and she's doing uh, perfectly fine with a survival for the past three years. I thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, Professor Ghayasar Navitaya, for such a wonderful talk. And our next speaker is another well-renowned name, and he is Professor Nikati Ormaki. He's Professor of Gastroenterology, Assistant Director, Ist Istanbul Health and Technology University. Dean of Medical Faculty, Istanbul Health and Technology University, Turkey. So, and his talk is over antibiotic uh, prophylaxis in cirrhosis, pros and cons. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to this important meeting. I wish you all a successful meeting. Bacterial infections are common in patients with cirrhosis, at least four times more compared to non cirrhotic patients. Bacterial infections in patients with cirrhosis may precipitate esophageal variceal bleeding spontan bacterial peritonitis, hepatorenal syndrome, hepatic encephalopathy, the compensation of the cirrhosis, in this case, survival for one year decreased at least 50%. Acute on chronic liver disease, increases morbidity and mortality from the liver cirrhosis, septicemia, and the death from the sepsis. There are several factors associated with increased risk of infection in patients with cirrhosis, such as cirrhosis-associated immune dysfunction, overuse of proton pump inhibitors, invasive procedures, hospitalization, malnutrition, alcohol abuse, 
genetic polymorphisms. Monocytes spreading chemotaxis, bacterial phagocytosis, neutrophil mobilization, phagocytic activity, intracellular killing, neutropenia due to hypersplenism are impaired in cirrhosis. So impaired immunity result in intestinal permeability, intestinal dysmotility, and bacterial overgrowth. Some of the predictive factors, such as modulation of gastric acid secretions, decrease in intestinal motility, lack of uh, bile constituents, antimicrobial peptides, and part of hypertension are also associated with intestinal overgrowth. Almost one third of hospitalized patients with the compensated liver cirrhosis may have secondary infections during antibiotic prophylaxis. Among them, 33% urinary tract infections, 24% SPP, 13% sepsis of unknown origin is seen. It was shown that mortality rate caused by bacterial infections in cirrhosis in the last decade was 30% in one month, 63% in a year, we have to be in a hurry for the diagnosis and the treatment of all infections in patients with cirrhosis. The delay in the administration of the adequate antibiotic is associated with an increase up to 7.6% in mortality per hour in the first six hours. The frequency of infection episodes in a year may play in role in on the rate of mortality. For example, more than three times the episode of the infections may also increase the all cause of mortality. After the diagnosing of infection in liver cirrhosis, as soon as possible, we should perform cultures from the urine, feces, throat, blood, and the we should begin to give empiric antibiotic treatment. But antibiotic treatment should be chosen according to type of infection, risk of MDR bacterial infection, severity of the infection, and the local epidemiology. Which organisms uh, are responsible for infections in patients with cirrhosis? There are several infections agents such as extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing enterobacteriaceae, methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus, enterococcus fasium. Those bacteria is isolated in 34% uh, of hospitalized patients in cirrhosis. So increasing those uh, uh, bacteria make lower rate of infection resolution and also a greater probability of septicemia and higher mortality rate. Recommended empirical antibiotic treatment in patients with SBP are cefotaxim or ceftriaxone or amoxicillin with or without clavulinic acid for community acquired infections. Piperacillin, tazobactam or meropenem with or without glucopeptide or linozolid for nosocomial infections. Similarly, for urinary tract infections, ciprofloxacin and the cotrimoxazole is used. For nosocomial infections, piperacillin tazobactam or meropenem with without glucopeptide is used. When we should use antibiotic prophylaxis in patients with liver cirrhosis, so there are several indications uh, for the prophylaxis. One, primary prophylaxis of SBP. Two, secondary prophylaxis of SBP. And third, patients with gastrointestinal bleeding. And the third, other indications, for example, animal bites, dogs, or cats. In meta-analysis, about primary prophylaxis of SPP, norfloxacin 400 mg per oral a day compared to placebo improved to survival in patients with cirrhosis. Including criteria was low protein acidic levels, 
advanced liver failure, serum bilirubin level more than 3 milligram, impaired renal function, serum creatine level more than 1.2 milligram per deciliter, blood urea nitrogen level increased uh, more than 25 milligram per deciliter, serum natrium levels less than 130 milli equivalent per liter. So uh, it was shown that peptide is used. When we should use antibiotic prophylaxis in patients with liver cirrhosis, so there are several indications uh, for the prophylaxis. One, primary prophylaxis of SBP. Two, secondary prophylaxis of SBP. And third, patients with gastrointestinal bleeding. And the third, other indications, for example, animal bites, dogs, or cats. In meta-analysis, about primary prophylaxis of SPP, norfloxacin 400 mg per oral a day, compared to placebo, improved to survival in patients with cirrhosis. Including criteria was low protein acidic levels, advanced liver failure, serum bilirubin level more than 3 mg, impaired renal function, serum creatine level more than 1.2 mg per deciliter, Blood urea nitrogen level increased uh, more than 25 mg per deciliter. Serum natrium levels less than 130 mg equivalent per liter. So uh, it was shown that... Sorry for the inconvenience. Actually, there is a technical issue regarding the internet connections. So we will resume uh, as we fix uh, the communications. Here we will move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is... Professor Ibrahim Mustafa. He is Professor of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Liver Transplantation. He is Muted. Chair Education Committee, World Endoscopy Organization. President-elect Pan-Arab Association of Gastroenterology. He, is all, he, all has, he has also served as a past president, Pan-Arab Liver Transplant Society. And his talk is over the use of beta blocker in decompensated cirrhosis. Jury is still out. Pakistan, which I visited two times before. I have many friends there. Also, many, many of uh, the Palestinian doctors visit Egypt. And I hope that uh, the corona, this uh, something which is very bad, it be finished, that we meet each other face to face, uh, inshallah, in uh, Cairo in December next year. Uh, normally, we have many people. Uh, I like to thank Amna very much, which is a fantastic lady, uh, also and, and very intelligent. And Amna, it is one of the uh, stars, and I think she become a stars now. Uh, she was also in the emerging stars at WO, but uh, I feel now she is going more than stars. She become a leaders, and they hopefully a very good uh, uh, futures uh, in Pakistan and all over the. She gave me a picture, she gave me, sorry, a lecture, which is Peter Blocker in decompensated cirrhosis. Jerry is still out? No. So we will, we will go with this uh, smoothly, face by face. Is uh, Peter Blocker is all, is gold, or is not? Non-selected Peter Blocker are the, are the ministry of treatment of portal hypertension in the setting of liver cirrhosis. Randomized study demonstrated efficacy in preventing initial parasitic bleeding and subsequently re-bleeding, and could prevent liver decompensation in patients with compensated cirrhosis. Benefit limited efficacy in patients with end-stage liver disease, reflex reactivities, and infections. What's called strabitic window hypothesis questions that. Uh, non-selected beta blockers 
use it earlier, so Rosas without, media, with, without medium storage of viruses. This is question and caution to avoid impatience with ended cell liver disease, especially with refractory acids. There is a new one and the traditional one. Carbidrol, which is a new one, reduces portal hypertension more than traditional uh, propanol, terminol, and nadrol. Clinical perfume is a new indication in compensated cirrhosis. He has an interesting anti alpha 1 antiallergic effect, which causes intrahepatic vasodilatations, which causes intrahepatic vasodilatation and decreased water hypertension. A low dose, which is from 6.02.5 to 12.05 milligrams. Carbidinol does not case hypotension, but decrease portal pressure significantly than propranol. What's about congestive gastropathy to prevent bleeding in uh, congestive gastropathy should drop hepatic venous pressure but at least 20 percent blue or blue 12. this can be achieved in about 50 percent of patients receiving propranol and about 75 percent when using carbidinol even the propranol non-responder normally what is the indication the indication is to prevent formation of gross or viruses what's called the primary reflex there is no enough evidence support the use of non-selected beta blocker to prevent the development or growth of viruses in patients with cirrhosis with without viruses or with small viruses with the sun so don't use it prophylaxis of ferrous bleeding primary prophylaxis patient with high risk viruses compensated cirrhosis monostrator beta blockers and endoscope band locations are considered equally effective in the prevent the ferrous bleeding patient with high risk versus medium to large size or a patient with decompensated cirrhosis PNC patient with high risk versus compensated cirrhosis used with more risk cautious and this is a, a very old one which compare about uh, band ligation and propranol they prove that band ligation is better than propranol which in 2003 What's the better now for the primary prophylaxis? Pharmacological therapy may be better than endoscopic treatment given the ability to prevent decompensation, which is a new one, given the ability to prevent decompensation. Still, whether combination therapy is more effective and safer for primary reflex. This means to combine band ligations and beta blockers. Recent evidence showed that non-selected beta blocker in patients with compensated cirrhosis and the clinically significant portal hypertension can prevent various decompensations, nam namely ascites. And this is a new, this is a recent study, which, which is the it is the address of these lectures. And the score of ligation is not likely to prevent uh, ascites, and non-selected beta blocker emerging as a preferred option. So this is a new thing, which is he was speaking about the decompensation of the liver and ascites, which can be prevented. Prevented of recurrent bleeding, normally band ligation, we repeat it here in our center, on my opinion, every seven days. Normally all over the world, we try to make it 15 or, 20 or uh, 21 days, but I think seven days, it's broke me in the last 30 years, it's better to prevent bleeding during occlusion of viruses. Once eradicated, usually repeated every three to six months, first line of therapy for all patients, combination of both non-selected beta broker and band ligations. Band ligation can be used as a monotherapy if there is intolerance or contraindications. This is something new which gastric viruses and ectopic viruses. There's one single study that cyanoacrylate injection is more effective than beta blocker to prevent the ferrous bleeding in patients with large oesophageal viruses. Guideline advocate non-selective beta blocker for the primary reflexes of, of gastric OB2 and uh, based on potential lower risk of complication 
and the possibility of decomposition event. No guidelines for ectopic viruses. Portal hypertension gastropathy, uh, current guideline recommend non-steroidal beta blocker the first line cell to prevent recurrent bleeding from bust congestive gastropathy. One study compared carbidrol versus propranol versus bad ligation for primary prevention of uh, 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 bleeding, per se, bleeding or uh, uh, congestive bleeding. Carbidrol is and propranol group have a lower risk of uh, congestive bleeding, congestive gastropathy, or portal hypertensive gastropathy compared to those under endoscopic therapy. This means when they use this beta blocker, they lower the risk of portal hypertensive gastropathy as comparing to endoscopic therapy. So this is science which is really good for beta blockers. This is all of you know about that, about the indications and the contraindications of the treatment uh, of uh, beta blockers. Uh, it, is, uh, it is easy uh, to understand that and uh, something absolute like uh, AB block or critical ischemia or asthma, some unrelated like diabetes and uh, hypoglycemia. When to consider reducing the dose or discontinue when you have a hypotension, systolic less than 16 or mean arterial blood pressure less than 65. Develop the acute liver in kidney injury or hepatorenal syndrome, when, you have, when the sodium, hyponatremia, serum sodium, less than 130. You know about this side effect, which is, you should understand, I should discuss with your patients about that. This is very important also to discuss with them about you may get weakness, you may get short term release, you may get dizziness, you may get nausea. Uh, so you should discuss with them about this side effect. So my opinion, it's possible that in near future, patient may be treated a la carte, which means you can treat every patient in portal hypertension and also in decompensated cirrhosis uh, drugs. And the new things, it is that the beta blocker can use and uh, prevent decompensated cirrhosis. What is the take home message? That the indication to start non uh, 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 sorry, non-selective beta blocker has extended recently to prevent decompensation of patients with compensated cirrhosis. This is my opinion with the drugs of cardinal. It's a very good uh, uh, things in patients with uh, compensated cirrhosis that it can prevent the decompensation. Doses must, must be titrated and re-evaluated in all patients, especially in patients with decompensated cirrhosis and with deterioration or liver failure. Data from observation study are contradictory regarding the safety of non-selected beta blocker inhibition with refractory ascites or infections. Further randomized study should be included patients with decompensated cirrhosis to assess efficacy, dose tolerance limit, and safety. I try because uh, I like to be face and face, but this year in December, which is the same day when I have my lectures, but at four o'clock in my time, seven o'clock in Pakistani times, I have one hour speaking about the 22 years of our workshop uh, and postgraduate course we started in 1990. So we'll have one hour. Half of this hour we speak about our course and the nice thing is that half an hour it says uh, uh, Professor Zay Hawass, and all of you know about that, will give a lecture about uh, gastroenterology, hepatology, endoscopy, and medicines in ancient time since seven years, since seven millenniums. You know, Egypt is the, celebrated the seven millenniums. All over the world, they celebrate the seven millenniums. So we we'll speak what the ancient people do about the liver, about the gastroenterology, about medicines. I hope that every one of you can look for one hour at one o'clock, at seven o'clock Pakistani time, four o'clock among that. And this is a link down. And I also I will send the link to the organizing committee to know that. But in the meantime, 
I like to win all of you in the 24 uh, uh, course for a sabbatical endoscopy and 14 postgraduate course in December 2021 at 11. And I hope that everyone will come to see the Nile, to go to the pyramid, to see modern Egypt, and to visit all the nice places and to enjoy with us that. And I hope that also I can visit uh, Pakistan again. Hoping, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Amna. Thank you, all of you. I hope to enjoy that. It's a short lecture, but I am very happy to introduce that. Thank you, and see you very soon. All right. Thank you, Professor Mustafa, for such a wonderful talk. And I believe with this talk, everyone will be able to answer the controversial use of beta blockers in serotics. And I believe with the, when this uh, COVID pandemic would end and would be able to come and attend your uh, conference regarding the therapeutic endoscopy in Egypt, inshallah. And uh, along with this, and so uh, I'm sorry needed. for the prior, uh, sorry for the con uh, inconvenience that we faced prior. And due to technical issues, we could not get the complete talk by a professor Nejati or Maji. So we will resume our talk. Cirrhosis or without glucopeptide or linozolid for nosocomial infections. Similarly, for urinary tract infections, ciprofloxacin and cotrimoxazole is used. For nosocomial infections, piperacillin tazobactam or meropen with without glucopeptide is used. When we should use antibiotic prophylaxis in patients with liver cirrhosis, so there are several indications uh, for the prophylaxis. One, primary prophylaxis of SBP. Two, secondary prophylaxis of SBP. And third, patients with gastrointestinal bleeding. And the third, other indications, for example, animal bites, dogs, or cats. In meta-analysis, about primary prophylaxis of SPP, norfloxacin 400 mg per oral a day, compared to placebo improved to survival in patients with cirrhosis. Including criteria was low protein acidic levels, advanced liver failure, serum bilirubin level more than 3 mg, impaired renal function, serum creatine level more than 1.2 mg per deciliter, blood urine nitrogen level increased uh, more than 25 mg per deciliter, serum natrium levels less than 130 mg equivalent per liter. So uh, it was shown that one year probability of developing spontane bacterial peritonitis, 7% versus 61%. Epitorenal syndrome, 28% versus 41%. Improved three months the mortality, improved one year mortality, and also probability of survival compared with placebo. Beneficial effect of fluoroquinolones compared to placebo was shown in meta-analysis. Spontane bacterial peritonitis and serious infections risk are reduced. Beneficial effect for fluoroquinolones compared to placebo was shown in meta-analysis and also mortality risk is reduced. In another meta-analysis about the antibiotic prophylaxis for cirrhotic patients with upper GI bleeding was shown that antibiotic prophylaxis was associated with reduced all cause of mortality, mortality from bacterial infections, uh, reduced bacterial infections, reduced rebleeding, reduced days of the hospitalization. There are several risk factors associated with the development of infections caused by MDR microorganisms. Nosocomial infection, prophylaxis for SVP, use beta lactams within the past three months, infection due to the MDR microorganisms without, uh, within the past six months. 
in order to prevention of MDR organisms in cirrhosis and improvement in prognosis, we should do rapid microbiological tests and then uh, new first line antibiotic schedules, antibiotic uh, stewardship programs, other infection uh, control practices and epidemiological surveillance. If we diagnose infection with methicillin resistant staph arrows, we can use vancomycin, daptomycin, linozolid, or tigacycline. If we uh, culture vancomycin resistant enterococci, then we can give uh, daptomycin, linozolid, and tigacycline. If we can culture ESBL producing enterobacteriaceae, then we can give carbopenems, uh, uh, piperacillin, tazobactam. Uh, if we can culture the, the carbopenems uh, producing enterobacteriaceae, then in this case, we can give uh, colistin, uh, uh, phosphomycin. Ladies and gentlemen, there are some pros of antibiotics prophylaxis in cirrhosis. These are antibiotic prophylaxis prevents infections which are related to high mortality. Antibiotic prophylaxis prevents occurrence and the recurrence of SVP in patients with low protein concentration in ascites. Antibiotic prophylaxis decreases the mortality rate in patients with low protein concentration in ascites. Antibiotic prophylaxis prevents rebleeding and infection, uh, which increases the mortality after esophageal variceal bleeding in patients with cirrhosis. Antibiotic prophylaxis reduces one year probability of hepatorenal syndrome and improves three months probability of survival. However, there are some cons of antibiotic use in practice in the with cirrhosis. These are occurrence of multidrug resistance organisms. The recently, these kind of organisms are unfortunately increasing from 10% uh, to 45%. Post transplant fungus infection ratio increases, risk of clostridium difficile increases, hospitalization longer than. Uh, the other uh, type, cost is increased, mortality rate also is increased. So uh, another cause of antibiotic prophylaxis in patients with cirrhosis is the drug toxicities and the drug-drug interactions. These are hepatotoxicity, ACLF, increasing of the liver enzymes, in hematology, anemia, thrombostopenia, and agronulostosis, in the heart, cuter prolongation, in gastrointestinal system, diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting, in general to urinary tracts, acute kidney injury, intestinal nephritis, drug-induced lupus, rash, and peripheral neuropathy. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Professor Normachi, for such a wonderful talk. And I believe with, it, with this talk, uh, we, we are clarified that uh, what are the pros and cons of the antibiotics, especially in cirrhosis. So coming to our next speaker, and our next speaker will talk about managing portopulmonary hypertension and hepatopulmonary syndrome. Our next speaker is Professor Amjad Salamat. He is consultant, gastroenterologist, and hepatologist at Kaide Azam International Hospital, Islamabad, Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome all to the uh, the species LD meeting. I'm uh, Professor Amjad Islamat. I work in uh, Kaide Azam International and, and uh, I'm a professor of gastroenterology. Uh, we're going to discuss today uh, management of Hepatopulmonary syndrome and portopulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary involvement in chronic liver disease uh, can take many forms. However, today's uh, in, uh, what we are uh, relevant here is the portopulmonary hypertension and uh, 
the parapulmonary syndrome, which we're going to discuss. So this is basically a triad um, uh, where he have a liver disease and uh, leads to uh, gas exchange abnormalities and uh, while the patient is breathing room air and this is due to a widespread intrapulmonary with dilatation or shunts. So comparing it to the portal, uh, portal pulmonary hypertension, uh, uh, basically in hepatopulmonary syndrome, you have a pulmonary vascular dilatation and the resistance is decreased. It leads to severe arterial hypoxemia and it may completely resolve after treatment. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in the portopulmonary hypertension, you have a severe vasoconstriction, which leads to right heart failure. And if it is severe, it may not be reversible after the treatment. Uh, we're talking uh, about now the pul hepatopulmonary syndrome at the moment. And uh, these patients may present with uh, spider nevi, and uh, they may be dyspneic when they are standing up. Their hands or fingers may become blue and they may be clubbed. But these uh, are not necessarily present in mild to moderate disease, and not all patients will show all the features. It is a fairly um, a common condition. However, uh, the prevalence, is, uh, as you can see here, there is a quite a lot between different studies. And um, it really depends uh, how much effort you make and uh, if you have a, a transplant unit working in that hospital. so. Uh, it can vary significantly. Uh, as uh, the management, uh, basically, in case of hepatopulmonary syndrome, no established medical therapy is currently available. Uh, basically, some of the drugs uh, can be used. Some people have used garlic. And um, if you have a large shunts, an embolization of shunts has also been tried. However, the definite treatment of this pa these patients is liver transplant and liver transplant certainly leads to reversibility, though this may, much, may, uh, may take a little time. And uh, these patients may uh, resolve uh, their problem after a year or so. So when do we suspect this hepatopulmonary syndrome? If uh, patient's oxygen saturation falls, and uh, if it is below 96%, one should do a screening echo. I think bubble echo is the best for that. If it uh, as normal, uh, the, this uh, condition is excluded. And if it is, of course, positive, it is diagnosed. Here, what happens if you have an echo and uh, echocardiogram, uh, you have the agitated saline, which produces micro bubbles, which are uh, injected. They appear in the right side of the heart and uh, on the left side of the heart after three to five cardiac cycles. If this is less than three cycles, this is usually because of a intracardiac shunt. So it has to be after three to five cycles. And yeah, you can see the left ventricle is uh, uh, has bubbles in it after that. Uh, basically what it indicates is that you have uh, left to heart, and left, uh, right to left shunt uh, in the pulmonary circulation. So uh, again, uh, with the same uh, same pathology in mind that you have uh, basically a shunt, uh, which may be because of severe vasodilatation, or you have it with the uh, intrapulmonary shunts, macroaggregated albumin uh, can be given to, di uh, to definitely diagnose this, these patients. Normally uptake in the brain is less than 6%. However, uh, as you can see here, uh, a significant uptake in the brain above six percent would definitely indicate that this condition is present. CT pulmonary angiogram is not done routinely. However, uh, if you think that there are shunts, the pulmonary shunts, and then it can and the patient can actually benefit from embolization of these shunts, CT would be indicated. However, the main role of this uh, CT angiogram is to rule out pulmonary disease and other diseases of the lung. On the basis of the diagnostic evaluation and the arterial blood gases, uh, this syndrome can be classified into uh, very severe, moderate, or uh, mild. Uh, so if you have this uh, uh, PO2 of less than 50 millimeters, it's very severe disease, and these patients may not do well or may have problems even with liver transplant. 
It can also be classified uh, type 1 or type 2, depending upon uh, the imaging studies. If you have diffuse normal vessels or fine diffuse spidery vascular normalities, dilatations only, it is type 1. And if you have shunts, basically, then it is type 2. So what happens? How is it does it develop? Uh, basically, it is thought that uh, uh, liver produces endothrin 1, which produces uh, increases the nitrous oxide production. And not only that, the bacteria translocation in these liver disease patients uh, leads to inducible nitrous oxide, which also causes the vasodilatation angiogenesis and hepatopulmonary syndrome. So here's a cartoon showing a homogeneous lung. And then this is a ca again a cartoon which shows a shunt. So either you can have a dilatation or you can have a right to left shunt, which leads to hypoxia. So moving on to pulmonary, portopulmonary hypertension, this is uh, characterized by increased pulmonary arterial pressure, uh, normal vascular, res uh, increased pulmonary vascular resistance, and uh, normal left heart, which means that you have a pulmonary wedge pressure of less than 15 millimeters. So uh, I, if you look at it, uh, pulmonary hypertension is classified into different types. And there are five types, and this uh, um, uh, portopulmonary hypertension is a group one where basically the arteries of the lungs are affected themselves. Uh, it is again not a, a very uh, common condition, however, uh, if it really depends where you're looking for. For example, in the transplant units and those hospitals where you have a transplant facility, uh, this uh, prevalence is uh, more common as compared to the uh, general population seen in the routine. So here again, as you can see, and not only that, also in different among different transplant units, the incidence can vary. And there's a comparison between the Baylor and the Mayo Clinic. And here you can see there's a, about a three point differences uh, in the prevalence. So uh, it is a, a clearly increase in the pulmonary uh, artery pressure. Uh, but uh, the defining thing is basically and the increased pulmonary vascular resistance and uh, a normal left heart. And uh, trans uh, pulmonary gradient is being increasingly used uh, to define that also. And uh, this is usually greater than 12. And of course, uh, clinically, you have to have the evidence of uh, portal hypertension uh, and the liver disease. Uh, this is not only uh, that you have uh, in cirrhosis, but you can have it in non strotic portal hypertension. So the pathology has something to do with the development of portal hypertension rather than necessarily the parenchymal liver disease. So it is not necessary that you have a liver parenchymal disease, but it is important that you have a, a portal hypertension. As you can see here, there are multiple factors which are thought to contribute to portal pulmonary hypertension. So you can have hypervolemia, hyperdynamic circulation causing increased shear stress. Uh, you can have uh, emboli in the, because uh, you can have coagulopathy in cirrhotic patients. The cardiomyopathy can prevent spawn. So all these, um, then you have the neurotransmitters, uh, ne uh, sorry, uh, chemical like nitroxide, endothrine imbalance, prostacyclins, and uh, chemical uh, dysfunction. And uh, then you can have uh, autoimmunity and shear stresses. Uh, all those things can actually lead to uh, portopulmonary hypertension. Uh, if you look at the microscope, it's not in, uh, you can't really differentiate that this is um, basically because uh, it has shared the pathology with any other uh, type 1 uh, pulmonary hypertension and uh, the thrombi and plexigenic changes uh, can be seen, um, which leads to increased pulmonary resistance and the pulmonary, portopulmonary hypertension. Uh, females are uh, thought to be more predisposed to development and uh, autoimmune hepatitis has a uh, a relatively higher incidence or a higher uh, prevalence in cases of uh, portal pulmonary hypertension, um, comparing that to hepatitis C, where uh, it is less. Uh, this may be the reason that we are actually see a small number of cases in our setting. But again, uh, maybe uh, our data is skewed, and one needs to look at uh, those patients who go undergo the liver transplant. Uh, but um, uh, again, um, I have an impression even talking to my colleagues who do transplant, this is entity is not as common as it is in the those uh, centers which actually deal with the, a different spectrum of uh, uh, liver disease going on to transplant.
Survival, as you can see, in, as compared to idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, uh, portal pulmonary hypertension has uh, uh, basically a dismal uh, outlook uh, vis-a-vis uh, what's the reason. Uh, I think it's probably not only the pulmonary hypertension, but also the liver disease and other pathologies uh, which lead to uh, this increased mortality. So should we be screening for pulmonary hypertension? Of course. Um, so basically, uh, I think uh, it takes us a little time to set in. So one can start uh, uh, screening with Doppler echocardiography. And uh, those patients who have an NCPH as well as CLD should be screened. And of course, uh, one, can, uh, one should be screening those patients who are being ready for liver transplant. And these uh, patients who are going on for liver transplant because uh, pulmonary hypertension, this portal pulmonary hypertension can develop it over a very short time. These patients should actually be screened every three months. And uh, there are many cases which are actually discovered on the table, uh, sometimes because they've been missed. Uh, so especially if uh, the patients complain of dyspnea while uh, they are waiting for the liver transplant echocardiography uh, screening should be done. So uh, comparing it to a hyperdynamic circulation hypovolemia, basically in uh, portal pulmonary hypertension, you have an increased uh, decreased cardiac output and uh, normal or decreased uh, capillary wedge pressure. And as you can see here, and the pulmonary vascular distance goes up significantly. How do we diagnose these patients? Um, so if you have a patient with portal hypertension and you have the symptoms of dyspnea and other things of portal hypertension or you suspect there's something wrong with the chest x or EKG done, then uh, and alternate diagnosis have been excluded based on these. So these are the patients who should have a, a transthoracic Doppler echocardiogram. And then if you have right ventricular systolic pressure, uh, which is uh, higher than uh, 38. Some of the units use a higher value. Some of them use a lower value. I think uh, it ranges between 35 to 40. Uh, but in any case, uh, the threshold for right heart catheterization is usually above 40 or 38. So this is again uh, uh, an algorithm for screening for purple hypertension. And uh, what it emphasizes is basically uh, that if you have a Port, uh, mean, mean pulmonary artery pressure of greater than 25 millimeter. And then I think considering pulmonary vascular resistance uh, would uh, differentiate it uh, from other causes. Uh, for example, if you have a high flow rate, then the pulmonary vascular resistance is actually low. And if you have uh, mean pulmonary artery pressure, which is less than 25 and, va and pulmonary vascular resistance, which is low, then probably and this entity does not exist. So uh, one has to uh, look into right atrial pressures, main pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressures, and cardiac output and pulmonary vascular resistance. And uh, greater than three Woods unit uh, basically would indicate a portal pulmonary hypertension. So management uh, basically um, is uh, if uh, the patient is a liver transplant candidate or if the patient is not. Uh, basically, this slide is not showing very well, but I'll move on to the other thing. Basically, if you have a liver transplant, of course, then these patients should be screened and they're really aggressively treated because definite treatment uh, for these patients in the early stages and aggressive treatment can make uh, all the difference. Uh, so what are the tools we have or what are the uh, medications we have? Basically, uh, we have... Uh, uh, Ileprost, IV, basically prostacycline, and uh, endothelial receptor antagonists like bosentan, sildenafil. Uh, these are all effective, as you can see, basically short term, but none of them has been effective long term. Um, IV prostanol basically has a problem with the administration; it can cause side effects. It is difficult to do that, and uh, the patient, patients have to come in. If there's something wrong goes wrong with the IV line, and uh, that's a limitation. Uh, Bosentan sildenafil can be given orally, uh, but uh, they have short-term side effects. And uh, however, all of them, uh, if you look at the right side of the slide, all of them improve survival. So early and aggressive treatment in case of portal pulmonary hypertension makes a difference because if these patients are reversed before liver transplant, and especially those patients who have severe disease. 
and they may not benefit from even transplant if uh, they do not reduce their pressures uh, before transplant. So uh, as you can see, uh, if you treat these patients, uh, the survival is uh, much better if you don't treat them. And uh, uh, Embrisentan has been used and Embrisentan uh, has been used and uh, both uh, improve uh, basically uh, pulmonary vascular resistance and survival. Cardiac output goes up, pulmonary vascular resistance goes down. As you can see, I mean, uh, uh, mean pressures in the pulmonary artery also go down. So, uh, uh, IV prostanol again, I mean, uh, our pulmonary artery pressure and mean pulmonary uh, and uh, pulmonary vascular resistance is improved. And certainly, uh, these drugs can be considered. Uh, usually, you start with the oral uh, antagonist. And then if the patient and you measure uh, uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance and uh, pulmonary artery pressures, if they don't go down, you uh, increase the dose and you take it up. And uh, if, uh, if they're not still responding, you move on to IV prostanol and, uh, and things like that. Uh, I inhale dilaprostra is uh, easier to administer. Uh, again, uh, survival benefits and, of course, efficacy has been shown. Um, but just uh, in those cases who are going to go transplant, I think probably IV prostanol is preferred. However, uh, if the patient cannot take an IV prostanol, no, then hyaluprost uh, should can be tried. So as the final treatment is uh, liver transplant, and uh, and uh, one if once uh, once we have diagnosed that uh, these patients have uh, portopulmonary hypertension and they are proceeding to liver transplant, uh, but then we have to determine the severity of these. Uh, uh, severity of the parotopalmy hypertension in these patients. Right heart catheterization is necessary and important. And based on these, uh, basically diagnose, diagnosis where you have a normal pulmonary capillary, uh, this uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and but a higher pulmonary vascular resistance of greater than three volt units. Uh, and depending upon the right heart pressures, we classify them as uh, low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. Uh, if they have a pulmonary artery pressure of less than 35, the transplant can take place, there's a low risk, the prognosis is good. However, it is between 35 and you have a pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, which is less than 400 dynes per centimeter, liver transplant can, however, take place, but uh, they are at moderate risk, so 50% of them would have some problems. Uh, those patients who have a very high uh, right uh, uh, pulmonary artery pressures and right heart pressures, and they, uh, the transplant is contraindicated because they're very high risk. So looking into these values, and uh, if these patients are to portal, uh, portal pulmonary hypertension, uh, and they, uh, the transplant is contraindicated because they're very high risk. So looking into these values, and uh, if these patients are incidentally discovered to have portal pulmonary hypertension on uh, intraop, 50% 50, 50 mortality, and they should actually be uh, taken off the list and then treated aggressively. And uh, again, um, their hemodynamics should be assessed. And if they improve, they can uh, be relisted for transplant. However, if you have a pressure high, but the primary vascular resistance less than 240, you can proceed to uh, with transplant. That possibly these patients actually have an increased flow. Uh, however, uh, I think uh, the transplant team and the anesthesiologist has to make this decision, and, uh, and they are the best, um, and that is why you have to have a very good anesthetist uh, who can uh, uh, decide uh, on the table. So, uh, in the end, I conclude that uh, portopulmonary hypertension and hepatopulmonary syndrome are not uh, infrequent uh, complications of liver disease. Uh, they basically result from uh, diminished hepatic clearance of splanchnic vasoactive substances. They cause uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction and portopulmonary hypertension and actually uh, dilatation in cases of hepatopulmonary syndrome. Uh, in portopulmonary hypertension, you can have right ventricular dysfunction and uh, which can lead to uh, right heart failure and increased mortality. And if these patients are not treated, they would die. The only lasting treatment, of course, is liver transplant and um, the prognosis is uh, unpredictable in cases of uh, portopulmonary hypertension, however, it is very good in cases of hepatopulmonary syndrome. Uh, they may take time to re resolve this condition. It may happen over a period of years, but it resolves. And I think 
uh, if these patients do proceed to transplant, I think uh, the steology team plays a big role in uh, managing these uh, patients well. Thank you very much. And uh, I thank uh, PCLD management, their IT team. We have done a wonderful job. And uh, most of all, the patient audience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Amjad. And it was such a wonderful and a nice talk. So we have a few questions from our audience. Uh, first Unmuted. question, our first question for Dr. Amjad is that patent foramen ovale is prevalent in 20 to 25 percent of our adults. How to distinguish concomitant presence of HPS in such patients? Do we okay. have? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can. Okay. Uh, I think this again. Uh, the, this is, uh, if you do the right heart catheterization, uh, it can differentiate that. Even, um, for example, a bubble echo can also differentiate if uh, you have to differentiate between hepatopulmonary syndrome and uh, this uh, ASD. If you put in the bubbles, the agitated saline uh, on the right heart side, it would appear within uh, less than three to six beats in the left side. So that would actually differentiate from hepatopulmonary syndrome. So in cases of, if you're uh, wondering if it's an increased flow in cases of portopulmonary hypertension, uh, then uh, the right heart catheterization, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and the uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, if these three parameters are taken, they can actually decide. For example, if you have an increased flow, the pulmonary vascular resistance would be low, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure may be normal or a little bit raised, um, but the pulmonary vascular resistance is certainly less than three words. And so that would differentiate in those cases where there's a confusion between pulmonary hypertension. And sir, and if that. there is concomitant so, disease? Yes, and this concomitant disease, if you have that, then I think echocardiography would also help, uh, not only the bubble echo, but the structural, uh, structurally, if you're looking at it, uh, looking at the pulmonary pressures, and that can actually, and then the, if then you do the right heart catheterization, that will definitely uh, 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 give you the right to left shunt in case of AST. Yes. All right, sir. Thank you. And uh, another question by Dr. Fakha Kazi for Professor Ghayas yeah. and Tayyab. And the question is, like, is there any benefit of terlipressin infusion over bolus in HRS? Connectivity. Okay, so can we? Have, the question is like uh, any benefit of telepressin infusion over bolus in HRS? So uh, can we have our uh, like even the chairs can help us in the, uh, answering this question? Doc, we have Dr. Bakhtabullah, we yeah. have Dr. Bashir Ashi, or anyone even from the speakers can also. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, if you can, I think uh, <clears throat> recent, the initially the trend was <clears throat> giving. Uh, the logic behind giving the bolus dose was that uh, if you gave the terlipressin, what it does was it, it decreased the portal pressure in the splanchnic circulation, and then this affected lasted for a long time <clears throat> as compared to the octreotide, which was then compared because that effect would last. That is why octreotide had to be given an infusion because the portal pressure would decrease. Uh, very or increase pretty quickly once you stop the infusion. So the bolus worked, but I think there has been a recent trend, and they found that it's maybe more effective and have less side effects if you give an IV infusion. But uh, IV infusion, as you can as you see, it would actually have a little bit of logistical problems giving it administration and all those things. So by and large, I think it works very well, even in bolus. Um, but yes, recent in easel, I think also in the last year, and, uh, some people said that IV infusion is probably a better way to give it and slightly more effective. But I don't think this makes a big difference if you look at the data on the papers. That's what my impression is. Uh, I'd be happy to be corrected if I am. <laughs> okay. okay, can we ask, uh, can we have Dr. Vakhtbuland on online? Yes. Okay, Dr. Bhatbalan, can you share your experiences regarding management of hepatorenal syndromes? Dr. Bashir Ahmed? You need to unmute your mic. Please check your mic. 
Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, as previously said, the, still, the literature is favoring the bolus, but the working is going on regarding the infusion. We haven't a clear data, but the practically people who use, they are saying the infusion is much better than the bolus one. But still, we have to wait and see about the data available. All right, thank you, sir. Yes, Professor Altaf Alam. Do, do we have Dr. Professor Altaf Alam on board? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farhana. Um, you know, for uh, Terlipresin, it is easier to use in practice if you give in. Uh, a peripheral hospital, uh, the infusion sets and the ability to adjust the dosing uh, on infusion sets is probably lacking. So I would uh, really um, think, as mentioned, that current data uh, suggests that uh, bolus doses are as good as, um, uh, but you know, uh, as uh, Dr. Amjad Salamat just pointed out, there was uh, there was a abstract in the last easel meeting where it has it was given in an infusion form um, and the results were very satisfactory although there was no uh, comparison between the uh, bolus and the infusion uh, arm so uh, i personally uh, continue to use it as boluses uh, along with albumin and I tend to increase the dose as well after day three if there is no response to the low dose uh, turly present as well. So there is another thing that one needs to consider and do. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, I believe now it is quite clear that even now the boluses are much far, like uh, there is no difference as such in between infusion or bolus. And, other than that, uh, do we uh, any other comments by our speakers or by our chairs? All right, I believe. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, pretty uh, good. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, so I think there is an interruption in the connectivity. Um, we can't hear. So, taking the opportunity of presence of Professor Altaf Alam. So, uh, can I ask a question, Professor Altaf, if you're here? I think your mic might be unmuted. Interrupting. The session is an interrupted. The session is interrupted. The session is un interrupted. So, may that these talks are primers. So, uh, if we are practicing hepatology or interested in hepatology, you should look up these things which have been pointed out uh, in these presentations, and uh, possibly some of them have a conceptual change. So, that's more important. That's very important for the changing practice. Uh, I think the previous session uh, probably highlights that very much, especially in cases of ACLF. Uh, I think a lot of things have changed and uh, and they have practical importance. So I would submit that uh, many people, should, uh, a lot of people, especially the postgraduates, should look into that and uh, look at it in depth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so one simple question, Professor Altaf is over here. So as the first talk, the, be the role of the beta blocker in serotics uh, still should be using in decompensated patients or not. But if we do see uh, lots of our patients with child C in our routine, they've been like prescribed beta blocker, they tolerate very well. 
So what is your perspective? Is this like scientifically what the data is saying? We know that, do we need more consistent data to support this? And in our practical life, do you think that uh, we should still continue with the selective group of patients, the beta blocker, and what should be that selective group where we still can give beta blocker uh, in, uh, among decompensated serotic patients? Uh, so many questions, uh, uh, Anna, question. but you know, uh, uh, the problem arises when the patient decompensates. Prior to that, there is certainly uh, no issue. Well, there are two things that I uh, uh, look at. One is symptomatic hypotension. The patient complains of uh, weakness and dizziness. Even in the absence of uh, uh, renal impairment, uh, I tend to uh, either first step reduce and then stop. So, you know, the patient has to tolerate it. Uh, and, you know, as Dr. Ibrahim Mustafa was just pointing out, that a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, you have to really, uh, because people don't tolerate uh, that they become symptomatic with it. So that is, in my opinion, the biggest uh, problem with beta blockers in decompensated cirrhosis. If they are tolerating, I tend to continue, reduce the dose maybe, but continue even in decompensated cirrhosis. And there is some data now that uh, it probably helps uh, in, in such decompensated cirrhotics as well, if they are able to tolerate the dose. So I think tolerability is the key. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, if I may add, I think it's the reduction, the mean arterial pressure, I think also in the studies which have been, uh, which have been uh, there already. Uh, plus, uh, I should point out that if you have a portopulmonary hypertension, uh, definitely the beta blockers should be discontinued earlier because that that is worsened. So if you have any any evidence of portopulmonary hypertension, uh, beta blockers actually worsen the situation. They should be actually stopped. Important point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I believe uh, with this uh, our session comes to an end. And uh, thank you, speakers, and thank you, our chairs, for being with us in this session in this session and uh, making it so informative and interactive. So moving to our quiz section. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So can we have the questions on hold, please? Quiz questions. HRS can be pre prevented by one of the following means. Number one, epinephrine infusion with the creatinine of more than 1.4, pentoxifil in use in alcoholic hepatitis, albumin infusion twice weekly in patients with ascites, mydodrine in patients. One, two, or three, or four. So. Okay. All right. So moving on to our next question. The next question is the existence of moderate to severe portopulmonary hypertension due to cirrhosis is an indication to go for number one, liver transplantation, number two, lung liver simultaneous transplantation, orthotropic liver transplantation, or none of, none of above. Okay, so now we have the answer. So for both of the question, Ramsha actually answered the right one. <laughs> 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 and and as usual, Ramsha is actually locked uh, Yase, so he could not actually answer. So you both are actually out of the game. Okay, <laughs> so one for is actually for different reason, and the other one is for the different reason. So who is <laughs> Now let's see. 
and uh, who is the next one so for the question number one jalpa again jalpa yes you may rest like okay now we are convinced farhan i said okay no let's let's this time let yes. it go to the jalpa thank yes. you very much jalpa so for she the first question she has been question, working really hard really hard uh -huh. the most enthusiastic participant Definitely. of this conference jalpa we will be giving you a, another certificate with this uh, appreciation <laughs> and for the second question uh, ramsha ramsha you are like out of the game and dr mohammad asif okay Dr. Mohammad Asif, please uh, share your contact number so that we can send you the prize money. Well, uh, so move this, now with this, our session comes to an end. Uh, we, we are moving to our next section, and that is where uh, a call. That is with. So our next and session is. It is uh, about portal hypertension and vascular diseases. Yes. <laughs>